Welcome back to Shattering Mist. We're going to turn the page and uh, consider what Yahweh had to tell us in the Torah because uh, it is the relationship that he has created with man that he has offered to, to uh, humankind. And by man, I mean men and women, uh, uh, mankind or humankind. And that the story is told. Um, with the creation of man and how God knelt down to uh, lift us up, uh, how uh, he thought that the creation of humankind was good, how he differentiated Adam from uh, the other homo sapiens that were outside of the garden, uh, bequeathing us with a nasama, which is a conscience in addition to consciousness. And uh, the nature of the relationship between men and women that God conceived and how interesting that was and how different it was than any other religious or political scheme where uh, men and women are, are equal and how uh, marriage would become the, uh, the catalyst for, uh, for family and for raising children that served as the model for the covenant, mother and father, as husband and wife uh, coming together in a loving home to nurture and raise children. But for there to be love, uh, for us to choose a spouse and to, uh, to love them, there must be choice. If there is no choice, then, then we're engaged in servitude. It is enslavement. And so free will became uh, sacrosanct, and for free will to have merit, there must be the uh, uh, both the option uh, to choose that which is good and that which is not good. And that is why in the Garden of Eden there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, so that mankind would have the option of knowing pain and suffering and that which was counterproductive to the relationship. Well, as we know, Yahweh allowed uh, Hasatan, uh, Satan, to slither into the garden and to misrepresent his testimony. He also allowed Chawa to add to and subtract from his testimony uh, so as to mislead Adam and that collectively they opted to reject God's advice. And for that, they were expelled from the garden. That brings us to Barashith in the beginning, Genesis 3.24. He, and he is Yahweh, expelled Adam, the man, toward the east from the protected and sheltered and closed garden, the Gan Eden. Eden means of overwhelming joy, delight, ultimate pleasure, and extreme satisfaction. And he caused cherubim to camp with the blazing swords who went back and forth to keep watch on the way to the tree of life. Now, we uh, considered uh, this uh, briefly during our, um, our program uh, on Friday. And what we come to realize is that, that Adam and the Chawa were uh, kept in a enclosure of great joy protected there in their relationship with Yahweh, separated from the dying and, uh, and pain that existed outside of the garden and had for quite some time. And that when they rejected Yah's advice, the terms and conditions, if you will, of the covenant, that they were expelled from his protection. Now, God provided a way back, and all through this account has spoken of the kara, or the invitations, to be welcomed back into his company. But the fact is that when we reject God's instructions regarding this covenant relationship, we are expelled from his presence, which means they were booted out of the garden. Now, as you can see, that there would be no reason for cherubim to, uh, to serve as guards or for them to be armed with flaming. That would be uh, metal weapons, uh, these uh, swords, the uh, cherub, these uh, swords that were, uh, were uh, lightsabers, uh, essentially. There would be uh, no reason for them to have them unless there were predators, unless there were men and women who would have wanted to get back or just enter that garden. And so they were there um, going back and forth along the walls of the garden to keep uh, homo sapiens outside of the garden uh, from entering, uh, as uh, well as uh, animals and other predators from uh, entering, because it is counterproductive to become immortal, 
to participate, to eat the tree from the tree of life. The tree of life is, is really a symbol of uh, the upright pole of Pesach, a Passover, upon which Yahusha hung as the Passover lamb. Uh, Passover is the doorway to life. To become immortal, but yet be imperfect, uh, is to be eternally estranged from God. It is extraordinarily counterproductive. And so God did not want that to occur. It's what Satan has inspired in the religion of Christianity, however, which is to partake in what occurred on Passover, although they don't call it that, uh, but to partake in what occurred on Passover, but go no further, which is to become immortal, but imperfect, and therefore eternally separated from God. Now, as we move through the Torah, the uh, karabum, the plural of karub, which is a masculine noun, are depicted hovering over the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. While it's evident they are spiritual beings in Yah's servants, which means that they are equivalent to light, we don't know a great deal about them. But since uh, karabu means mighty, and uh, karuz means herald, they have something in common with the Malak. The messengers are spiritual beings who serve uh, as Yahweh's envoys. We also know that, that like the Malak, which means messenger in Hebrew, the cherubim follow orders and thus exist in a similar command and control structure devoid of free will. All of the Malak are messengers, misnamed angels, based upon a transliteration of the Greek word angelos, for messenger, uh, they are, um, they're not typically feminine, they're uh, typically masculine, but they have no sexual orientation of any kind, and they are, uh, they are not loving because they're incapable of love because they aren't given free will. They are uh, wholly and completely devoid of free will. They are simply implements that Yahweh uses to achieve whatever he wishes to accomplish. Uh, Ezekiel uh, has the most to say about them, and what he conveys is that they radiate light, which means they're a spiritual being. They're equivalent to light, and that they can fly. If you're um, a a non-physical being, if you're energy-based, you can move rapidly from one place to another. In fact, rapidly is, uh, is a misnomer in this case because light can transfer itself from one part of the universe to another over what we would account to be uh, 15 or more light years in no time at all. And speed is always a measure of distance over time, and yet with light, with energy, time becomes irrelevant. So the, no matter how far uh, you move, since time ceases to flow, the speed becomes essentially infinite. Now, the central message here is that Yahweh has purposefully kept mankind from stumbling back into the garden and entering it without his express permission. There is a passageway, but you will not find it in Turkey, which is where the eastern Turkey under Lake Van is where the Garden of Eden was located. So there is no reason to look there. The tree of renewed life became the upright pillar upon which the Redeemer, the, the, the human manifestation of Yahweh, was hung. If you want to enter paradise, you'll have to enter through that gate. But you'll notice that that gate, that doorway to life, it does not stand alone. It is part of a three-day festival feast or a three-day invitation where all three of the, of the promises and benefits uh, are afforded to those who avail themselves of the doorway of Pesach. It's Pesach, Matzah, and Bokodom. It's one event three, occurring over three days. Pesach makes us immortal. Matzah makes us perfect. Removing sin and the consequence and the punishment of sin, which is separation from God. And Bakurim, which means firstborn children, enables us to be adopted into God's family. So when we avail ourselves of the doorway of Passover and go walk across that threshold which cleanses us, our souls, of sin called Matzah, and are adopted into Yahweh's family, then we are welcome back 
into the Garden of Great Joy, his protective enclosure, his home. In the next statement, we discover that Adam and Chawa uh, became one, and the first family was conceived. Now, of course, the first family here is being conceived outside of the garden, and so the first family is, the, is now being commenced at the day one of human history as it relates to the timeline from the expulsion of the Garden of Eden to the time that we are welcomed back into the Garden of Eden, which is going to occur on Sukkah in year 6000 Yah, or in October of 2033. Uh, Cain, which is the, which means, uh, it's Q-A-Y-N in Hebrew, uh, means spear. He was the, uh, he was born first and then Abel, which is from Hebel, which means futile breath. Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. A uh, considerable time passed and then we read, Cain brought the fruit, the harvest, the pari, of the ground, the Adama, as an offering, a minha to Yahweh. And then Abel arrived with the best firstborn from his flock of sheep. Yahweh was attentive to and accepted Abel and his offering, but he ignored and rejected Cain and his offering. So Cain became awesomely enraged and fell down on his face. Pane. This is from Barashith 4, 3 through 5. All right, so we've, uh, uh, we have Adam and Chawa and their uh, sons now outside of the garden. Um, and they're uh, seeking to, to reconcile their relationship, which was severed based upon their ignoring God's guidance. Uh, they're seeking to reconcile that. And so what we find here is that God has a provision to do that. And that provision is being presented as, uh, as the offering from, uh, of a sacrificial lamb. And God is saying that I'm going to accept the offering of a sacrificial lamb, but I'm not going to accept the offering of, uh, of fruit uh, of the ground. And that, of course, is pointing back to the doorway of Passover, which is the doorway to life and to the relationship. We'll be back in a second. So in this particular uh, insight into uh, what happened uh, after the expulsion from the garden as uh, Yahweh was uh, telling us that he would accept as a... Uh, as a remedy to uh, man's um, tendency to ignore his his advice, uh, a, a sacrificial lamb, which was of course uh, now predictive of what he himself would do uh, for the children of Israel um, with the sacrificial lamb. In fact, it's uh, it's indicative of what occurred uh, on Mount Moriah with Abraham and. Yishak, where Yahweh said, I don't want you to sacrifice your son. I will provide uh, the sacrifice, and he provided the sacrificial lamb there uh, at what is year 2000 Yah in the story of the formation of the covenant. And, of course, 2000 years after that, or 40 Yobel, we find uh, Yahweh again providing the sacrificial lamb, uh, the human representation of uh, God, the diminished manifestation of, of God, the Yausha, to be the sacrificial lamb of uh, Passover. And so that is what is being conveyed here, is that as a remedy that is acceptable to God, uh, as it relates to the penalty uh, or the consequence of ignoring his testimony, it's actually a consequence, which is death, the remedy for that consequence is the sacrificial lamb. That's just what he is presenting here in this passage. Now, as you see, that when uh, Cain became distraught that he had the wrong answer, rather than, you know, if you're dealing with God and you have the wrong answer, okay, let's say you're dealing with God and uh, you've chosen uh, Christianity and you're wrong. 
You've chosen Islam. And you're wrong. You've chosen socialist, secular humanism. And you're wrong. So at that point, you have a number of options. Cain was told that he was wrong. And what was his what was his response? He threw a tizzy fit. That's what he did. He threw a tizzy fit. He ignored and rejected uh, uh, Cain's offering. He told the Cain, you're wrong. And so Cain became awesomely enraged, incensed and furious. He had a tizzy fit. Then he fell down on his face. That's what he did. Now, what would have been a better option? Okay, you're a Christian. You find out by uh, studying Jan's testimony that uh, Christianity, which is based upon Paul's letters, is absolutely wrong. Not acceptable to God. What are you going to do? Throw a tizzy fit? You're going to fall down on your face and uh, worship the gods you have made? What are you going to do? Are you going to follow Cain's example? Are you going to throw a tizzy fit? Are you going to become furious and incensed, angry, which is typically what happens when you tell a Christian that their religion is false? Or, a better idea yet, Yahweh said, Abel's offering was satisfactory. What was Abel doing? He was offering the Passover lamb. God has offered us the Passover lamb. He says that's acceptable. So what are you going to do when you find out when God's telling you this is acceptable, that's not? Are you going to throw a tizzy fit? Be religious? Be angry? Attack the individual who's telling you you're wrong, in this case God? You know, when... My friends and I share the realization that Christianity is a false religion. And we quote Yahweh's testimony as proof of that. Almost all of them throw a tizzy fit and they attack Yahweh's own testimony. When Yahweh says that his Torah is complete and perfect and is the means to restore our souls and that it's easy to understand for those who are open-minded, and you share that with someone, they will attack God's testimony. They do just what Cain has done. Well, I've got a, an idea here for you that you may want to consider if you're amongst those who are still clinging to one of the myths of the many religions of humankind. There's a better choice. Rather than throwing a tizzy fit, rather than getting angry, rather than getting incensed with God, rather than falling on your face in worship, maybe, just maybe, you may want to listen to what God has to say. To embrace what he says is acceptable. Now there's an idea. So it's hard to know if Cain was uh, down in the face or if he looked depressed or if he was started mocking his brother by bowing down before him or even if Cain uh, prostrated himself in God's presence. Each of those options is uh, possible. They are not things that God condones. There are useful insights here. First, the best advice in the world is to figure out what pleases God and embrace it. That's what Yosha said during the conclusion of this Sermon on the Mount. He says, you know, not anyone calling me Lord, Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not a single person calling God Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But instead, those who embrace and act upon the will of the Father. You know, if you want to uh, go to heaven, if you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to be saved by him, here's a clue. Come to know and accept and act upon his will, that which pleases him, that which he says is acceptable. Shattering this, I said there were two insights that we can uh, learn from that last uh, statement where Yahweh know, told us what was acceptable and what was uh, not. Um, the second is the one that we've already mentioned, which is that Yahweh was telling Cain and Abel uh, that he considered the offering of a perfect firstborn lamb to be acceptable as a means to resolve the consequence of sin, which is death. From the really before the beginning, uh, that was God's plan. And as such, he is consistent uh, in presenting the Passover lamb as the solution. It was presented uh, as the solution uh, to the death of Yishak, meaning laughter, uh, when Abraham uh, met with Yahweh on Mount Moriah. It was the ultimate answer when Yahusha, as the human manifestation of Yahweh, 
uh, became the perfect Passover lamb on Mount Moriah in year 4000 Yah, 33 CE, on our pagan calendars. It is what Yahweh is proposing here. So as this uh, uh, continues, we find uh, Yahweh doing what he had uh, previously done with um, Adam, asking questions. You know, and that ought to, in and of itself, been an insight to us. If you want to learn, if you want to be aware, if you want to know, if you'd like to understand, follow God's example. Ask questions. You know, in the, the Friday program that I do on Friday afternoons on the Blog Talk Radio, we have been uh, focusing on the on a prophecy that Yahweh provided in Habakkuk. That's the most uh, riveting prophecy I'm aware of anywhere in, in Yah's testimony. It is, it is about uh, Shaul, who is Paul, being the plague of death, the founder of the Christian religion. God goes out of his way to say he is the plague of death. Um, and goes to great lengths to explain exactly why accepting uh, Paul's testimony is so deadly. And in, uh, in doing all of, uh, of that, uh, Yahweh asks us why we are unwilling to question him. And the name, it's interesting, Shaul's name, means question him. Uh, and God is constantly telling us, just as he is here, if you want to understand if you want to know, if you want to learn, you do so by asking questions. Now, could God have come up with this, the answer to these questions without asking the questions, perhaps? Well, I say perhaps because it is yeah, God's very presentation of himself says that he's not omniscient, he's not all-knowing, and he's definitely not uh, always present. He is not in a position where he is omnipresent or all-knowing, and if he was, then he would cease to be a unique individual and would eliminate the means to salvation. He's not a micromanager either. So God could be asking the question because he genuinely wanted to know, or he could be asking this question because he wanted us to know the way that we should go about coming to know and understanding the answers to important questions. So Yahweh said to Cain, why are you enraged and jealous? Hurrah! Why is your face fallen? Why is your head down? Why not? Cain answered. So, God wants us to, and it's a perfect question. As I said earlier, every time that a Christian is confronted with absolute proof that their religion is false, that it leads to their own demise it, uh, rather than to their salvation, they almost universally become enraged, hostile. And what God is saying, why? And then they will return uh, to, uh, to prayer as if their prayer did any good. God says specifically, does not listen to the prayers of those who are Torahless finds them uh, to be an abomination. And so God is saying, why are you doing that? I've told you who I am, proven that I exist through prophecy, and then told you what pleases me, delineating the terms and conditions of the covenant and the benefits of the covenant. So under those circumstances, why are you angry at me? Why? And what Cain answered is, why not? kind of like the Christian approach, just because, because that's what it means to me, because I can't believe that this, that, and the other. You know, Christianity is based on the notion that God died for, uh, to resolve man's sins, and yet God cannot die. You know, a, a God that man can kill is a God that man has conceived. And when you present that to a Christian, they call you an antichrist, a denier of, uh, of Christ, and Yet, it's precisely what God's told you about himself. But, I'll say, why not? You know, it's, it's what they believe. And it, even when God's testimony is contrary to that, they, uh, why not? So what? It goes right back to the nature of Hasatan when he slithered in the garden. He said, so what if God said? And that's the response of the religious. So what? Why not? So, Yahweh said, if you are um, good by nature, 
pleasant, pleasing, joyful. If you're, if you're not such a sourpuss, if you're pleasant and agreeable, fun to be around, you're going to find forgiveness and you're going to be elevated to a very high status, Syed. You're going to find your, your guilt removed. You'll be standing upright, dignified, not bowing down, not with your head bowed down. And if you aren't pleasing, if you aren't pleasant and joyful, then sin is crouching down in the opening, in the doorway to your life. You are into yourself and your intense desires and impulses. And these are things you must learn to govern, mashal, to understand and control. Wow, what a marvelous insight from, from God to us. You know, the, one of the things that is, uh, is typical of, uh, of so many religious individuals, particularly if you look at, uh, at Muslims, they're almost always angry and enraged. They're almost always unpleasant. They're just out, you know, they think the whole world is out against them. They're enraged against the whole world. They hate. They're violent. They're lashing out. You look at uh, today's socialist, secular humanists, particularly environmentalists, they're mad at humankind. They're envious of those who are successful. They're lashing out, trying to control others. You'll even look at so many um, fundamentalist Christians. Oh, they go to their praise service, and they, they all pretend when they're with one another to be how joyous they are, and then you look into their lives, and they're miserable. God is saying, you know, I didn't create humankind and form a relationship with you to be a downer. This is that whole idea of, you know, you, you bow down and God's saying, no, that's not the idea at all. I want a family. I want to enjoy sons and daughters. I, I, it's the, not only the nature of the covenant, the nature of what occurred in the Garden of Eden, but it's also the nature of the seven invitations to meet with God. Where Yahweh is saying, these are festival feasts. Let's celebrate together. I've provided everything. Just meet with me. And let's have a party. So God is saying, you know, if you, if you embrace these celebrations, these seven celebrations of Passover, Matzah, Bakurim, Shavuah, Teruah, Kippurim, and Sukkah. If you take each of these Moed Mikre, which are Chang, festival feasts, they're parties. And, you know, you're, you're fun to be around, you're pleasing, you're pleasant, you're joyful because you're celebrating with me. Then, he says, you're going to find forgiveness. That's how we find forgiveness, is, is by attending Yahweh's seven annual parties. That's how you find forgiveness. And that's how God provides us with a high status where, where he not only adopts us, making us sons and daughters of God, which is the highest status you can have, but he empowers and enriches us. It's through his festival feasts. And he's saying that, that the Passover lamb, which he was saying is acceptable, that's the doorway, the entrance to the parties. He says, so if you come to these parties, you're going to find forgiveness on a very high status. But if you aren't, if, you're, if you aren't partying with me, if you aren't having fun with me, then sin is crouching down in the opening of your doorway. And it truly is. And God says, you are way too into yourself. You're too intense with your own desires and impulses. These are things you must learn to control. And if you talk to a religious person about their religion, even when you prove that it's wrong, they'll say, well, that's not how I feel about it. You can't tell me that I don't have a relationship with God. They're way too into their own personal feelings. What God is saying is if you want to have a relationship with him, attend his parties. Recognize that the doorway to life of Pesach is where we first meet with him. Recognize that God wants us to celebrate these festival feasts. And that we ought to listen to what he has to say and respond to it. As opposed to being so into ourselves. 
Yahweh's advice to Cain was attitudinal. It was relational. This was a learning experience, and thus it wasn't appropriate for Cain to be depressed, or either physically or emotionally. God doesn't want us bowing down before him. He wants us to rise up, stand up, and become ever more like him, elevated in status, dignified, honored, majestic, if you will, as a result of the benefits or the promises of the covenant. And relationally, no one wants to be around a grump. I mean, if you look at the first four Moed Mikre, which were fulfilled by Yahusha in the uh, and the set-apart spirit in 33 CE, year 4000 Yah. And you look at the benefits of the covenant relationship, which is immortalized in the conditions that existed in the Garden of Eden. What you find is that these first four parties, these first four invitations to celebrate our relationship with God, provide all of the benefits of the covenant. They make us immortal, perfect, adopted children of God, enriched with his guidance, empowered by his spirit ever more like him. Relationally, no one, as I say, wants to be around a grump. God most certainly doesn't. That's the reason why God is very selective, very discriminating. It comes that who participates in his family. And he chooses based upon our choices. If we choose to accept his terms and conditions, then he accepts us. And those who accept his terms and conditions recognize they're participating in parties as his children. They're not grumps. They're not bowing down. They're those who explore his testimony, listen to what he has to say, think about it, come to know him, come to understand what he's offering, and embrace it with a smile, standing upright, reaching up to him. That is the nature of what is being presented here. We'll return to Shattering Myths after the commercial break. Returning to uh, God's testimony, uh, Yatab, which is the word that uh, Yah uses, uh, meaning being of a of a positive attitude, of uh, of being a person who likes to have fun and of celebrating. That's what God is saying that He's looking for in us. He's looking for people that that have a positive attitude. It's one of the things that I, that I found so interesting in. Uh, and studying Yah's testimony. The first thing that you learn is that rather than giving us a bunch of laws uh, which are to be obeyed, the Torah doesn't mean law. It means teaching. It means guidance. If you find guidance useful, if you find teaching exciting, then you're going to love the Torah. But if you want a bunch of laws that you have to obey, you're going to hate it. It's not what it is. And there is no Hebrew word for obey. I don't even have a word for obey. So he most certainly isn't asking you to obey a bunch of laws. He doesn't have, doesn't call his testimony law, and he doesn't tell you to obey. He encourages you to listen, to observe, and to respond to what you learn. And what you find is that he's encouraging a family relationship where no grumps allowed. He wants in his family laughter. The first child of the covenant is Yishak. For those who have listened to this program, who have read Yada Yah or the introduction to God, you know what Yishak means. The first child of the covenant defined the purpose of this relationship. Yishak means laughter. When uh, Sarah fell down after hearing that uh, that uh, Yahweh had told Abraham right before her uh, that uh, she was going to bear a, uh, a son, and she was 90 years old and he was 100, and she uh, fell down laughing, that God said, oh, I'm going to get you for that? I'm going to condemn you for that? No. The purpose of the covenant is to laugh. It's why the seven invitations to meet with God, Pesach, Matzah, Vakotam, you know, uh, Passover, unyeasted bread, firstborn children, and the promise of seven, Shavuot. It's why they are called Chog. Chog is the Hebrew word for party hardy, festival. Let's have a feast. Let's have a really good time. 
They are the seven invitations to meet with God. They are the means to salvation. They are the, the, the means that God uses to enable the covenant's promises. I mean, God is saying here, if you are like him and want to have a good time, and you're willing to listen to what he says as opposed to throw an angry tizzy fit, you're welcome. If your propensity is to embrace the family of Yahweh, the covenant, you'll find salvation. If your propensity is to be religious or political, you won't. You'll find sin. So that's the whole nation notion of Yatab. It doesn't just mean, you know, to be good or do good. It's about being pleasant, being pleasing, being happy, being joyful. What was the garden named? Eden means joyful. What is the covenant about? Laughter. Yahweh, and since Yahweh has used Tob time and again to convey the idea of being good, it means that Yatab is speaking of the attitudinal aspects of goodness that are appropriate, which are being happy, pleasing, joyful. God wants us happy. That's why he offers his advice. That's why he encourages us to pay attention to what he is offering. And therein lies the entire purpose of this discussion. Abel listened to God's lead, and Cain's did not. One found himself accepted and favorably regarded, and the other was ignored and rejected. Heaven is for those whom God values. He values those who value him. It's a very simple equation. You can be religious. God allows you that. But understand, if you are, he does not know you. You will not be saved. Cain's issues are central to mankind's problems. We are all too often led by our emotions rather than by our minds. That is to say, we rely more on our nefesh, our soul, our consciousness, and animal nature than our nesama, our conscience, the ability to be discerning, discriminating, and judgmental, even rational. You see, the difference between the descendants of Adam and Chawa and the rest of uh, Homo sapiens is that they had an asama. But just having an asama, a conscience, an ability to be judgmental and discerning, does not mean necessarily that you'll employ it. And that is what God is encouraging us to do, to use our conscience to be discriminating, moral, and judgmental, so that we do what is acceptable to Him and therefore beneficial to us. <laughs> 